So we finally arrived at week six of our sermon series, Connecting the Dots. I'm praying that you have enjoyed this journey of connecting the dots in your own life because life is lived forward, but it is understood backwards. So today in our, in our last installment, I simply want to talk to you around the theme, this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is the moment we've been waiting for. How about you join me in a quick word of prayer? Dear God, my prayer is that you will simply do what you do. It is amazing how you can speak to us in so many different ways. You can answer prayers we haven't even asked, bless us in ways that we've never even expected, Heal heal us in places we never knew were hurting. So God, I simply pray that you would do what you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. After six whole weeks, this is the moment we've been waiting for. Now, we spent the last five weeks looking at the life of Joseph, and it all started with the dream. Now, it's been a while since we've talked about that dream, so let's just take a moment just to look back at that dream. Because you you remember in his first dream, he sees his brothers working out in the fields and their bundles of wheat bow down to his bundles of wheat. Then in his second dream, he sees the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him. Now, it seems so far off because there was nothing about his current life that gave any indication that this was a possibility until now, until today. The pastor Mindy revealed on last week that Joseph has now become the governor or second in command over all of Egypt because his ability to interpret dreams opens up an opportunity for him to lead during a time of crisis. And it's revealed in Pharaoh's dream that there will be a famine in the land and they must store up as much food as possible to help them when the shortage arrives. Now, he's now entrusted with overseeing the food distribution for the entire kingdom, and on paper, Joseph is killing it. His his resume looks amazing. He has uh, a family now. He's found somebody to fall in love with. I mean, this is not the family that threw him into the pit. He's got respect. He's got power. He's well-known. I mean, he, he even has kids. He's come a long way since week one. He's come a long way from the 17-year-old boy that was thrown into a pit. But watch how God starts connecting the dots. Watch how it all comes full circle. Because the famine in the land doesn't just touch Egypt, but it impacted the entire region. And guess what happens? Guess what happens? The famine forces his brothers from Canaan to travel to Egypt to buy grain now. Now, now, they've heard about some hotshot in Egypt who could interpret dreams and was going to lead them through a crisis. And while Joseph is passing out grain, watch how it all comes full circle. When Joseph is passing out grain, he recognizes his brothers. And it's in that moment that he remembers the dream. We find this out in earlier verses that at that moment, It finally made sense. He remembers. He gets it now. I mean, this is the very first time that we get any indication that he remembers the dream that God was able to show him years ago. And Joseph recognizes them, but they still don't notice him. And then Joseph starts playing a few mind games with them. I mean, you can check back in earlier verses. I mean, I mean, he pretends to be a stranger. He starts talking down to them. He accuses them of being spies. He makes them sit in prison for a few days. He sets them up so they are accused of stealing. He makes them make a few trips back and forth to Egypt. I mean, Joseph is having a good time with them. I mean, to be honest with you, Joseph shows us a side that we haven't seen before. Normally, Joseph is calm, he's cool, he's collect, he's stable, he's wise, and now Joseph shows us the petty side to Joseph. I mean, like the real 
petty side that we have never seen. I mean, Joseph is getting creative with his pettiness. I mean, he's, he is, in fact, I admire, I admire his pettiness. I mean, he makes them do things and he makes them go back and forth. I mean, he is really stretching this thing out. But something happened. Because after Joseph is done with his pettiness, something happens that we haven't seen from Joseph in almost five weeks. Joseph breaks down and cries uncontrollably. Now, if you go back and read the earlier verses, you could almost see it coming. Because he sees them in chapter 42, and we are reminded that after he finished speaking with them, he began to weep. Then in chapter 43, when they come back with their youngest brother, it said that Joseph had to hurry out and look for a place to weep and went into his private room and he wept there. But now in our text, now in our text, Joseph absolutely loses it. Everyone can see him. They can hear him. It's that ugly cry, that that sobbing cry, and he tries to hold it back. But after all that he's gone through over the last several years, it finally pushes its way out. Joseph has been waiting for a moment to just let it all out. Now, here's what's interesting. He doesn't cry when he gets thrown into a pit. He doesn't show this kind of emotion when he's falsely accused. Now, when he gets thrown into a prison, now when he's forgotten about for two whole years, which lets us know that he survived his trauma, but he hasn't dealt with it. At that moment, Joseph shows us that success and fulfilled dreams don't always heal old wounds. I mean, we can't outrun every dot because the effect of some dots linger beneath the surface of our success and then something triggers it. And we realize that certain dots still impact us and yet it's hard for us to believe that elevation doesn't heal those emotions. In fact, this past week there was some, so much conversation around Simone Biles, arguably one of the most decorated Olympic gymnasts Ever. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's a title, right? I mean, I mean, there was so much conversation around her these last few weeks because in one competition she pulled herself out of it because she said she lost her place in the air and she didn't feel mentally right and it felt unsafe to compete. Now, the fact that this was such news revealed that in some ways that we are really uncomfortable with success and wounds existing in the same person. I mean, she's won over 30 medals competing professionally. She grew up and was in and out of foster care. She is the last competing sexual assault victim from the from the physician that had been in the news for months. I mean, this is not some amateur we're talking about. I mean, I mean, I mean, she is she is one of the greatest Olympic gymnasts to have ever competed. But I think it says so much about us as the audience. Because in some ways, I think that we are great as an audience for people to display their gifts, but not their wounds. Maybe that's why when Jesus was asked to prove his divinity, Jesus does not show up feeding thousands. Jesus does not show up healing blind men. Jesus does not heal leprosy. But Jesus shows Thomas his wounds. In fact, author Henry Nowen uses the term wounded healers. But let's make this fit. I think to some extent we are all wounded fill in the blank. We are wounded dreamers. We are wounded spouses, wounded parents, wounded sons, wounded daughters, wounded, wounded people. And even though, even though our wounds are not always our fault, healing is still our responsibility. I mean, Joseph, this was not all of his faults, but he has some wounds that he has to deal with, but he's not depending on his brothers for his healing. So let me ask the critical question, what dots have you survived that still need to be healed? Because in his wounds, he's watching God's dream for his life come true. 
here he is, here he is, passing, passing out wheat to his brothers. Here he is, passing, passing out wheat to his brothers. The dream is, is I mean, he's, he's living the dream, passing out wheat to his brothers who are now bowing down to him. And he remembers it's, it's complete. But I think if we stop there, we wouldn't be doing the story any justice. Because I don't want you to leave here thinking that just because you dream it, that it's going to happen. So let me say this, don't get mad at me, don't get mad at me, just, just stay with me. God is not obligated to help us fulfill our dreams. I mean, that's what we're often told growing up and even as adults. We're often told you got to get a dream and you got to dream big. And we even have fancy slogans. It takes, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. Let your dreams be your wings. If you can dream it, you can do it. If you just work hard enough, your dream will come true. Dream it and you can be it. For much of our lives, we've been encouraged to dream. But if we get technical, this was not Joseph's dream. It was God's dream. Nowhere in this story do we get that this is what Joseph wanted for his life, but somewhere along the way, God's plan for his life became his plan. Nowhere do we find Joseph trying to jockey for any of these positions. I mean, when Joseph was in prison, he didn't apply to be the warden. He didn't ask to be the governor and to be the one who distributes the grain over the entire kingdom. This was not his aspiration. All that we know is that he simply wanted to be faithful in whatever role that he had. Joseph spent more time chasing God and his dreams followed him. I mean, Joseph reveals that one of uh, the most important relationships that we have in our lives. It will, it will determine so much of our lives. It will determine the direction. It might determine where we live. It determines our circle of friends. It determines how we spend our time. I mean, let's see if we are on the same page. Uh, you can write it into the chat, uh, write it in your notes. But what's one of the most important relationships that we have in our lives? Say it to me. Say it out loud. Just, just write it in the chat. Uh, say it out loud, write it down. What's one of the most important relationships that we have in our lives? Can I tell you? One of the most important relationships that we have is with the things that we want and desire. And it's often that relationship that often determines so much of our lives. Now, I'm not saying don't be ambitious. I'm not saying don't work hard. All I'm suggesting is to be mindful whether it's God's plan or your dream. And the two are not always synonymous because if we are not careful, our dreams, our dreams become our idols. Sometimes we end up worshiping the dream as opposed to the one who gave us the dream. And sometimes the dream can become distractions and we spend more time chasing the dream than we do desiring God and some of us have ruined we have we have almost ruined our families chasing our dreams we've become um, unhealthy people chasing our dreams sometimes our faith journey becomes hindered because we've been chasing our dreams and here's what I fear here's what I fear I think we often assume that chasing our dreams become synonymous with doing God's will for our lives. And then, and then we hold God accountable for making our dreams come true. And then I know you're asking the, the critical question, how do I know if it's my dream or if it's God's dream? How do I know if it's God and how do I know if it's me? Two things I want to tell you. Here's how you know if it's God's dream or your dream. Number one, if you don't need God's help to accomplish it, chances are that's us, that's our dream and not God's. Think about it. Why would God give us a dream where God was not a central part of the equation? 
We have to ask ourselves, do I need God's help to see this accomplished? Because there's no way a Hebrew sold into slavery becomes governor over all of Egypt if God is not part of that. If I don't need God to fulfill this dream, chances are that's us and not God. Number two, is this dream about me or is it about someone else? Because think about what Joseph is doing. He spent all of these years, the last several years, has now led up to a moment where he has the power and the prestige and the name and the title, and God has led him to a place where he's passing out grain. The title prestige. He's governor, second in command, and God has done all of this so that he can pass out grain to hungry people, so that he can give to people in a famine during a food shortage. This entire dream, it wasn't about status. It was about service. It was about his ability to be used during a difficult time. It wasn't to uplift his name. It was so that God can use him in service for other people. It had nothing to do with Joseph being in charge of people. It had everything to do with how he was going to be used. So perhaps if the dream is all about us, maybe that's not God, but that's our dream. I mean, that's what he's been waiting for all of this time. I mean, God was working on something so much bigger than one person. It wasn't about Joseph. I mean, at that moment, Joseph realizes that the dots were just not about his life, but about the lives of thousands. Is this dream about helping you? It is, is, is it about helping me? Or is it about helping somebody else? Because depending on how you connect the dots determines the story that we carry with us when that moment arrives. I mean, this is absolutely vital. It's absolutely vital to Joseph's story, and it's so important to how we approach moments in our own lives because now Joseph has the same people that threw him into a pit groveling at his feet. Now, some of us, some of us, uh, uh, this would be a day made in heaven because, uh, and because of that day, he's been falsely accused and thrown into prison for 12 years. Now, can you imagine the possibility of responses that Joseph could have had? I mean, if this would have been us, there's, the Bible would look a whole lot differently. I mean, Joseph, Joseph's story could have been, this was your fault, you did me wrong, now I'm going to do you wrong. I mean, his story could have been one of abandonment. His story could have been one uh, centered around the people that have discounted him. His story could have been how people closest to you caused the most pain. There are many stories that these dots could have told. There are many pictures that could have been connected with these dots. So let me pause and ask another critical question. What story have you been telling yourself? What story or narrative has been defining you? I mean, it, I mean, it's the story that we bring to every church. It's the story we bring to every relationship when we show up. What are the stories that we keep bringing with us? It's the athlete that keeps talking about the four touchdowns that he threw in middle school, right? Some of us keep telling the same stories over and over again. But let me suggest to you today that it's possible to reframe and reconnect some dots so that we tell a different story. I mean, that's exactly what Joseph does. Look at the story that Joseph tells. Look, look at the power of reframing, reframing your past so that you can tell a different story. Listen to the story that he tells. He says, I'm the one you sold into Egypt, but don't be too hard on yourself. Stop, stop beating yourselves up over that. I mean, it's, it's all good because, because now I can save lives. Now I can use my gifts on a larger scale. 
I mean, they've had this famine for two years, but now I see that God sent me ahead of you to save your lives. I'm here to help you. I thought it was to help Egypt, but now I see that it was to redeem you. He's reframing the story. He mentions nothing about being lied to. He mentioned nothing about prison. He mentioned nothing about being forgotten because he is reframing the story that defines his life. He mentions more about the good he's been able to do and not the things that have happened to him. That's not the dominant narrative of his story. I mean, that's easier said than done because reframing old narratives help us to have healed memories. Say that with me, healed memories. It's a way of returning to old dots and reconnecting old events to help us draw a different picture. In fact, I went to a retreat this past weekend in Houston, and the goal of the retreat was to help men develop contemplative practices of spirituality to help us live our most expansive lives. I mean, it sounds, sounds fancy, but if you know me, you know this is totally outside of my comfort zone. I've never even said the word contemplative in a sentence. I mean, but it was, it was amazing. And there was one exercise that broke us down. Now, I, I, I want to respect the confidentiality in the room, but I just wanted to share the practice with you because the facilitator invited us to close our eyes, and she said, now imagine a painful experience early in your life that has been ingrained in your mind. So that's what we did. We closed our eyes. The room got quiet. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. Then, then, then she messed us up. In fact, I want you to try it with me. Now, normally this takes several minutes, but I'll at least introduce you to the practice. Close your eyes for just a moment. Close your eyes. Imagine a painful or traumatic moment that happened in your childhood. Now, imagine Jesus walking into that moment Imagine Jesus walking into that situation and what do you think he would say to you? What, what do you think he would want to tell you? Now when she asked that question, you could hear one sniffle, then two, then three. I mean the question messed us all up. And when we opened our eyes and had a time to share, we realized that when we did this experience, most of us, most of us had to admit that we had been telling ourselves a narrative or we had connected the dots or drew a picture that was either incomplete or untrue. Sometimes the most painful thing is not revisiting the moment, but letting go of the picture or letting go of the narrative that we've always told ourselves. Because it's hard letting go of the same story or the same picture that we've been telling ourselves. Joseph says he reframes the entire narrative and says, what well, you meant for evil, God meant it for good. He's reframing it. He's healing old memories. And that's, that's the narrative that he's been able to tell after being thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, stuck in prison for 12 whole years and forgotten about for two and he gets out and the narrative that he tells himself that defines him is that what you meant for evil God meant it for good because he's able to tell a different story Joseph is clearly able to articulate God's role in his life he's able to give credit where credit is due you see, part of the contemplative exercise was geared around the practice of inviting God into those unhealed dots. Because all through Joseph's story, you find the phrase, and the Lord was with Joseph, or Joseph found favor. It's one of those narratives where God is covertly intervening unless you can start to connect the dots. I mean, God is doing the work behind the scenes. But it's the Bible's way of inviting us to see God as this continuing presence in every single doubt. I mean, the fact that Joseph doesn't assign blame to his brothers 
is pretty remarkable because if he assigns blame to them, he's ultimately giving them credit for everything that's happened. I mean, Joseph is able to see a larger move of God happening that is far beyond their actions. It's bigger than his brothers. It's bigger than Potiphar's wife. I mean, if Joseph blames them for all this happened, then he has to give them credit for all this happened. He's got to give them credit for the promotions. He's got to give them credit for the rise to power. He does not assign blame to his brothers for a single dot in his life. Instead, he names their actions and still points to the sovereignty of God in his life. He connects the dots for himself and for them. Well, you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Because connecting the dots is really our invitation to assign credit where credit is due. It is having the courage to revisit old dots so that we can see new possibilities. It's like at the end of the movie when they roll the credits. All they're trying to do is make sure the right people are given the appropriate recognition. In fact, the next time this happens, I want you to pay close attention and look at how meticulous they are about assigning credit to literally all of the roles. I mean, it starts off with the main characters, then moves to the lesser roles. They give credit to the person who's walking across the street, the person who ran the lights, who designed the costumes, the person standing at the payphone. Every part of the story is given appropriate credit. So I'm hoping that after six weeks, you can look back over your life and rediscover the miracles that have already been there. Because the dots are not just moments, but they're miracles. It's the invitation to connect some of the dots or connect some of the miracles that maybe you might have missed. The opportunity to use those miracles to tell a different story, to heal some memories. Because I think that once that we start connecting the dots, we will see that God has been truly present all throughout our lives.